Right. My name is Veronica Santiago Lu, and I welcome you to this space. Um, it's, I'd say it's a new space, but it, when I say that, it's not really a new space, and it's not really ours. And but first, we'll acknowledge that it would be on the homeland of the Lenape who are finally displaced as a result of European settler colonialism over the course of 400 years. The Lenape are the diasporic people that remain closely connected with this land on its right for stewards. Currently, we at Word Up are calling this particular <laughs> space recirculation. Um, but before I even explain what recirculation is, I know it's a new space to many of you. I wanted to find out who has been to Word Up before, Word Up Community Bookshop. Hey, a good number of you. Word Up uh, is a, we're at, the main space is located on Amsterdam Avenue, 2113 Amsterdam, uh, at the corner of 165th Street. So still just a few blocks away, still in Washington Heights. We were founded almost 11 years ago. It's going to be our birthday in about a week. <laughs> So Word Up started 11 years ago, minus a week, um, and it started as a pop-up shop. It was supposed to just be a one-month-long project. You didn't even really call it a shop. You know, we, uh, we thought we would be around for a month, and we got people walked in and said, we need to keep this place forever. You know, this place full of books and art and people and their neighbors and uh, just a, this community space that people could do with what they wanted. So we, we got extension after extension, uh, you know, two months at a time throughout that first year until we were at our original location for a little over a year. At that point, in August 2012, a new landlord had closed down the place. And so the collective that had built up over that first year continued to work together. We met wherever we could. We did events, you know, bringing books and storytelling wherever we could without a, without a place and uh, eventually opened up where we are now in 2013. We've um, been at that location now almost for, for nine years. Uh, we still operate as best we can, as collectively as possible. Uh, at any given time, there are about 60 active collective members, maybe like more like 40 pre patent now that you know, post during pandemic. But, uh, you know, they're, uh, it's really what you know. everybody wants to make of it. Uh, so we invite all of you to, um, in whatever corners of the neighborhood or beyond that uh, you're in, if you, wanna, if you wanna make anything happen there, if you wanna um, bring programming to the space, if you wanna volunteer, if you have students who, vol who wanna volunteer, uh, we really welcome everyone giving their input into making that place. So uh, that place, you know, we, I say that because to differentiate from here, but this place came about because one of the collective members from our early days uh, had passed away from COVID in June 2020. And right before he went on a ventilator, he called and let me know where, how to get into his apartment, uh, in his one bedroom at Inwood, the four storage units full of books and records. And so when he passed in June 2020, uh, we, a lot of his old friends from Word Up friends and friends of friends, then moved his stuff slowly here. This isn't even the extent of it. You know, we eventually got evicted from the space before he finished moving out, but the books here, the, the tens and tens of thousands of books that are in this space, and that started this space, uh, came from that initiative to really keep circulating in the community what he, what he wanted. You know, you find on those books post-it notes of the names of people he intended to give those books to boxes. I don't know if the person wanted them all, you know, <laughs> it depends, but it was definitely the thought. And, you know, many people did, did reunite with books that, you know, were intended for them here, but there are many more that still were recirculating. So he, he called them, like his email was like recirculation. Or that. So that's the name of this space. And uh, so anything, you know, we're about to, we've been here, we're about to sign a lease on this place as well. So we can do you know, word up things here, do anything uh, in the community that, that you wish. And it's all the books that are used or pay what you wish. Um, there are some new books from Word Up, but um, not everything from Word Up is here. But, you know, between the two, we can get you what you need. And any of the money that goes to donate here goes toward Word Up's programs. Um, 
So yeah, on to the event. Uh, thank you all for being here, and I'm, I'm really excited about this event. I'm excited to listen to what the conversation will be that will transpire. You know, after you know, after after meet uh, the after meeting Georgia during the launch of Borders of Dominicanidad that took place at Word Up, um, and other events since, it was it was really truly heartbreaking to read the what had transpired at Harvard when um, I you know I was reading it all after after the fact, but it, it was hard. It was really hard to read. Um, and the you know someone recently introduced me to the phrase post traumatic growth. Um, which I was thinking about when just looking at the, 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 the book and looking through it, and it seems like you know what's happened since the products like this book, this agenda as you call it in the in the opening, there are models of how how to stand in the face of such a struggle. Um, and I want to also mention that I will introduce more properly uh, Dr. Lorgia Garcia Peña and Debra Paredes. Um, I also want to. Apologize because uh, we've had a lot of publishers tell us about the supply chain. <laughs> Despite having ordered this book a month and a half ago, we actually saw it this morning. <laughs> yeah, after many inquiries. So we don't also have um, that rest book here, but we, you know, we should arrive <laughs> sometime, and we will uh, be able to make sure. Also, also, I noted that there's a further reading section here in the beginning of the book. All of those are at the other location now. There's a few copies here, but um, please use this as a resource as much as you wish. Dr. Lorgia Garcia Peña is the Mellon Associate Professor of Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora at Tufts University and the co-founder of Freedom University, Georgia. She's the author of the award-winning book, The Borders of Dominicanidad, Race, Nations, and the Archives of Contradictions. Dr. Garcia Peña is one of the 2021 Freedom Scholars, the 2018 Martin Luther King Jr. Fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and the recipient of the 2017 Disobedience Award. I like the name of that award. <laughs> Garcia Peña received a PhD in American Culture from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and an MA from in Latin American and Latino cult, uh, literatures from Rutgers University. Debra Paredes is a poet, scholar, and cultural critic. She's the author of the poetry collections This Side of Sin and Year of the Dog, a New York Times new and notable poetry book, and winner of the 2020 Writers League of Texas Poetry Book Award. She's also the author of the award-winning critical study, Selenidad, Delina, um, Latinos and the Performance of Memory. Uh, she is the co-founder of Canto Mundo, a national organization dedicated to Latinx poets and poetry, and a professor of creative writing and ethnic studies at Columbia University. Her book of literary nonfiction, American Diva, is forthcoming from South Del Norte. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here, especially um, after having spent time with this book over the last few months. Uh, and it is really a pleasure to be able to be in conversation with Loja, but also with everyone here in this particular space. And so we will begin um, this evening by having Loja, as it says on the program, reading for a bit from um, this ofrenda. And then um, we'll have a little exchange um, that will then grow out and radiate, hopefully, to be much more of a, a communal one. So without further ado, I would love to introduce to you all my colleague and uh, inspiration, Lorcha Garcia Peña. Deborah, and thank you all for being here. So many faces I recognize. It's so beautiful to be at 
this new location I haven't hadn't been in this situation, but I am so much part of the world of family. I love this space, it's so important to me. So any anything I publish will always, always, always start and end or find a place at Word Up. So I'm I'm going to read a little bit and jump around a little bit. Um, and before I do, I just wanted to preface by saying this is a really personal book. It's very different, so some of you might be familiar with my previous work. This is nothing like it. Uh, so if you haven't read it, you know, just bear with me. It's a little bit of my heart in here, a little bit of my rage, too. My experience, while singular, is not unique. The pervasiveness of the one model is all too familiar to women of color professionals working in competitive fields in the United States and other global North countries. A Latina friend of mine once told me that her experience of working in a major financial institution had prepared her for war. We met in New York one afternoon, and as we walked along the pier, I asked her what it was like for, for her to be a Latina analyst at such a prestigious institution. I have to admit, I was in awe of her success and curious about what I presumed was a glamorous life. And those of you who are academic you know what don't get paid very well. I had not yet told her about my experience of being the one. I remember she was eating ice, an ice cream cone and accidentally dropped it as I asked the question. She was laughing, maybe at having dropped the ice cream, maybe at my question, as she answered. But my memory, the laughter, made her answer even more kind, and this is what she said. It's like being in a war zone. This job has conditioned me to receive so much violence and to be triggered in so many ways that I, sadly, can't withstand the worst. Let me correct myself. Working in my office is the worst. It is war. They spit at you without saliva. They question your intelligence, your right to be there, Someone actually told me once that they preferred to hire a different candidate, but you know, since I checked the diversity box, they had to hire me. They had to. I am convinced my colleagues resent and punish me just because I'm not white. My friend says I grew pale hearing her speak. Like a ghost, she said, which made her laugh even more. When I finally cut my breath, I asked her a question I have been asked. Whenever I speak publicly about the institutional violence, I can even put someone on the Why don't you quit? She rolled her eyes at me before saying, Tu sabes por qué no? Why don't you leave Harvard? Uh-huh, and then what? Leave the next university, and the next? You know they're all the same, right? For us, it's all the same shit. I smiled and rolled my eyes back at her. As two Latinas of working class immigrant backgrounds, we share a tacit knowledge. Our careers are not just careers. They're jobs that support multi-generational members of our families. We cannot just quit, as we, contrary to what some of our colleagues have that have generational wealth, are the ones who made it in our families. Financial constraints aside, the challenges of being the one for professional women of color just sense academia. Or as my friend put it, look around you. Is it better in any other profession? Let's face it, unless I'm making their beds or caring for their kids, I am going to be perceived incompetent. There is nothing to do but fight. We gotta fight back. This is war. The experiences of unbelonging that my dear friend and I live through in completely different institutional spaces are sustained by white supremacy, by the belief that we, as minoritized women of color, do not belong that we are only allowed to be part of these institutions because of our race and gender rather than despite of them, that we are, quote unquote, diversity hires. This belief shapes every aspect of our work as women of color. It disturbs our physical movements through spaces, but it also burdens us with a responsibility for institutional labor regarding issues of race, diversity, and inclusion. That is, we're asked to lead the task forces on diversity issues, speak to our boards about equity and inclusion, and serve as mentors, leaders, liaisons for, for any and all conversations, plans, and institutional efforts to save face with our racial inequality. We are the band-aids they hope to put on their hemorrhaging racial wounds. 
part of what I do in the book is I share some anecdotes from my non-academic life and sort of how I came to the ethics of, of community as rebellion, as I call it. Um, and some of that comes from my upbringing uh, in a Dominican loud, very loud and very big and very loving and crazy Dominican family, and I wouldn't have it another way. So um, one of the anecdotes I share is about my dad, um, and that's from a different chapter that I call Reading List, Complicity with Whiteness Will Not Save You. So, When I was a young girl, I loved sitting on the sofa with my dad, watching action movies. The kind with the smart heist and a thief getting away with robbing a bank or stealing jewelry from the super rich. I remember feeling a sort of moral guilt at my desire to see the robber get away with a crime. Wasn't stealing bad? Shouldn't I be siding with the cops? One time, I must have been seven or eight, I asked my dad if we were becoming accomplices to the crime by watching these movies and cheering for the quote unquote bad guys. He paused, smiled, and look at me for a long time before answering something beautiful and incredibly profound that through my faulty and cloudy memory of my early childhood, I've chosen to memorialize as follows. Complicity means you're working with or benefit, benefiting from the wrong, some wrongdoing. We have not robbed the bank, nor have we gotten any of the money, have we? This is all for pretend. But there is a good lesson here, my daughter. Always look out for the accomplices in a bad situation. People who would cause you harm just to get ahead, to get a cut of the loot. They are everywhere, and sometimes, many times, they pretend to be your friend. On the other hand, make sure you find your own accomplices, the people who would support you and help you overcome the difficult things in life. That, too, is necessary for survival in this world. While I did not fully comprehend my father's advice at the time, and while I cannot remember the written everything he said, I never forget the meaning of his words, the meaning the words carried. Nor did I forget the sense of uneasiness they provoked in me. Years later, that uneasiness continues to haunt me as I understand how the complicity of my colleagues sustain the colonizing structures of the university that produce the logic of the one and exclude faculty of color from the longing. What does it mean to be an accomplice to the university's colonizing project of exclusion and unbelonging? And more importantly, how do we protect ourselves from the harm that such complicity can inflict on the lives and careers of women of color scholars? How do we find accomplices with whom to fight back? I think we can pause here. Thank you. share more later. Um, I had, uh, upon reading this book, there were so many um, moments where I wanted to, I, you know, I, I, I jotted down many things, um, sharing in your uh, insights and your rage and uh, your trans transformations that both uh, happen and that um, the book encourages. And so um, in, the, in the process, there were so many moments of the words that kind of came to the surface that you engage with and that you also help us rethink. And so I asked Roger if she would not mind if I, we did a little word association game as a way to start our conversation. And um, then we would move on to kind of elaborate on some of these words that I think she really brings uh, forward for us to dwell within. And so we're going to start, we'll just do a kind of rapid fire round a little bit, and then uh, we'll launch from there. I realize though I, I have my pen up here, so let me press. All right. All right, Loja. We'll begin with the usual suspect. Here we go. Community. Avert. Freedom. We. Oui. Rayano. Diversity and inclusion. Bullshit. <laughs> Latinx. No. Latinidad. In construction. 
Arturo Schomburg. The one. <laughs> Dura. <laughs> Accompaniment. Accomplice. Rebellion. And then last, ethnic studies. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to take a moment. <laughs> it was fun with your answers being as they were. Um, I wanted us to start with those because for me, those are the, the words that really rise up. That's sort of the word bank that I have taken from this book that really, I think, um, help us again, really um, rethink these words, expand these words, um, and uh, or perhaps deconstruct them in, I think, really important ways. And so I'd, I want us to have an opportunity to return to them, both collectively and um, between the two of us, but I want to just take a step or two back to think through, given that she provides for us such a, a wonderful uh, array of, of, of or, you know, words to, to dwell within, um, and given that there's also someone in the room who has very, been very important for my own mentorship, Arlene Dalila, I, I, I think this book is, is in many ways about right, the very traumatic um, experiences right, that so many of us uh, Latinas right, have encountered within institutions like the Academy. And yet it is also a book about finding those accomplices, right? those who like, are, I am a product of, right? we are products of. Of women like Arlene and others who helped us learn how to find them. And so I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit about um, who those were for you and how you learned to find them and what they taught you about being one for your students, as we see you demonstrate here. I've been very fortunate, um, both as a uh, can you all hear me? both as a scholar, but as a human being, to be nurtured by mostly women in my life. Um, and as a scholar, I, I kind of went through a very crooked and accidental by going to grad school. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Um, I didn't exactly know if I was going, what I was going to do with a PhD. I went into academia thinking, I want to learn more. Um, I want to write. Uh, I was coming from journalism and I knew that's not the writing I wanted to do. Um, I was really interested in research, but I really didn't have a grasp of what I wanted to do. Um, and I managed to get a PhD without getting that grasp. And so after, after graduating from Michigan with a PhD, I was fortunate to land a postdoc at Syracuse University with, in the Women and Gender Studies program with Chandra Mohanty and Linda Curry mm -hmm. and Jackie Alexander. And it was like being held mm -hmm. and pushed in the right direction mm -hmm. in ways that um, shaped me forever, right? Um, they not only modeled what it was like to, what, what, a, what a good teacher was supposed to do and a good mentor was supposed to do, but they also cared for me. I was pregnant at the time with my son. It was a scary time because this is after the recession, 2009, there were no jobs. And so the, the way in which they cared for me as a whole person was really important. So over the years, I was fortunate to find, to build, to commune with so many other people along the way and to pay forward. And in the process of doing that for my graduate students, for younger uh, people that I found on the way, they in turn also became my community mm -hmm. and my accomplices. So it's been um, a very reciprocal process of, of multi-generational caring and supporting uh, each other with a lot of um, 
sincerity um, and desire or I guess maybe conviction that the classroom can actually be a transformative space and that those of us who are teachers, whether you're in high school or in college, that's the space that you actually control. Everything else is out of your hands. So go do what you want to do in the world in there. And so, yeah. absolutely, yeah. thank you. Related to that, and this is going to go back to some of the words, um, you know, you use, um, or you, you again return to, I should say, words like Rayan uh, consciousness, which we, of course, first hear in your book, Borders of the uh, Minimalidad, and the word Gura and Gura, so talk about words. And I'd love if you want to, for those who haven't yet had a chance to um, read uh, the book, if you can tell us a little bit more about what these, elaborate on these words and their relationship to what you just described. Mm -hmm. Of course. So, the word rayano comes from the Spanish raya, which literally means a line. And so um, I come from a country, the Dominican Republic, that shares an island, an island with Haiti. And there's a border. And if you know anything about Haiti and the DR, you know that there's a border. Now they're building a wall. Um, and so that first book was um, very much grappling with what does it mean to be Dominican? Uh, in relationship to, mul to a multiplicity of borders, not just the Haiti DR border, but borders that are not visible, like the borders between the US and the Caribbean, uh, the US Mexico border that shapes all of us who identify as Latinx, even if we're not Mexican. Um, and the, the people of the border, of uh, Haiti and the DR border, are known as Rajanos or borderland people or people from the Raya. And I in the book, I thought of, of, of this idea of thinking of the border as a site of knowledge making, of, of a, a site of thinking, but also a, a hopeful process of belonging. Um, the Rajanos, traditionally in the Dominican Republic for multiple centuries, did not think or care about nation. That was not their problem. That was a problem of the governments and of the colonial powers that were debating where people should be placed. They understood themselves as belonging in that space, that interface, that we have heard so many of our Latinx people theorize from, right? And Saldua, Jose uh, Pinoal, things of the And so for me, embracing the idea of being in between it's, it's really powerful because it takes away um, that power of you must belong here or there. Um, and when you and some of my students are here, but I talk a lot about embracing that own belonging and sort of being comfortable in that barbed wire and not really needing, um, I, I don't need anyone to tell me um, that I belong here or, or there. Um, I'm really comfortable in this own belonging space. It, it makes me feel um, empowered. Excellent. And can you elaborate a bit on Gura and Gura's? So how many of you know what Gura means for Dominicanos? Gura's? <laughs> <laughs> how would you, how would you um, define el duraje? <laughs> So it's Dominican slang for like badass, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and it, yeah, matatana montra, right? <laughs> Courageous, right? So it refers to having courage. Um, it, re it refers to being good at what you do, to not be afraid, and so um, the idea of I I'm really interested, I'm, and I'm really, I really love Dominican slang. Um, it is the more evolved, right? Spanish, no matter what, the, no matter what the real academy of, uh, of fame wants to say, they can go fuck themselves. Um, so the, the way in which we are, our language um, in the Caribbean, Caribbean Spanish, or it, you know, all, all the Caribbean, the way in which our language um, and, embodies experiences of people and changes all the time. If you, those of you who are um, uh, immigrants like I am, if you spend five years or two, even two years without going back 
and you go back, you don't understand the kids no, anymore. No, I, language is new, and I and I love that. And so, um, Duda refers to the ability to um, continue to thrive, not just exist, mm -hmm. in whatever life throws you. And so, yeah, it's a philosophy that I that I love. So, I I'm sold. Uh, okay. uh, and I, my question here, so much of this book, right, is, as it says, right, a syllabus for surviving academia for women of color, um, and this practical aspect, right, as much as it, it is, it is um, crossing genres, right, in terms of it being you know, testimonial, being instruction manual, being uh, kind of uh, important history, disciplinary histories, right, or, um, and I um, find that that aspect of it, right, syllabus, meaning that this is something that we will be instruct, you know, instruction, and what does it mean to teach for freedom is one of my favorite questions in the book, right, that this is very much a project you've been invested in for your, your career. Um, and so, and I'm, so I'm interested in thinking and asking you, given that, you know, re, you know rebellion and accompaniment are the goals, right, and given uh, that Duras are, are the models by which we, we conduct our, our lives, in, uh, certainly in our work. On, an, on a regular day, what, is that, what does rebellion look like on a Tuesday? Well, if you're a woman of color, if you're a black woman, waking up and getting out of bed, it's already a triumph, you won. Um, existing and uh, being able to do the work you want your work to do in the world, um, despite all that is thrown at us on a daily basis, that's already rebellion. Um, I think we, we tend to think about rebellion as, you know, out in the street, uh, and that's part of it. And sometimes we will do that. Sometimes we will march, and sometimes we'll burn some fires, and sometimes we'll do some noise. And other times it's simply being in a space that was not created for you. And I think that a lot of people who have the immense privilege of moving around the world that was created for them does not understand, do not understand the amount of labor and the heroic labor that goes into just existing um, in this world and in these spaces. And so Tuesday, you wake up, you get up, you get your kids to school, alive, and sometimes fed and clean. Um, <laughs> and, you, and you make it to, to your work and you do your, your best to put the work that you are that you want into the world, and that is that is rebellion. Uh, that is going against everything because I don't know about you all, but the spaces that I inhabit were not created for me, and the idea was that I would die, right? And I vividly believe that all of these spaces are trying to kill me all the time, and so the fact that I am not dying and that I'm thriving and that I'm a Dura and that I get up every day. And I said, okay, I'm going to do my work. That already is an act of rebellion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. You talk a lot about what happens for you, what, what has your approach to the classroom, but also some of the really remarkable things that happened in your classroom or beyond the walls of the classroom because of, of the syllabi that you created. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, both one of your favorite moments from the classroom or from lessons you learned from your students and are one of the more humbling moments that happened for you that were, was part of your transformation or part of what um, enabled you to continue to sit with that question about what it means to teach for you? So I'll pre preface that by saying I love teaching. I didn't know that I would when I went to graduate school. I had no experience teaching, and any of you that have, has, that, that have gone through a graduate program in a public institution like I did, they throw you into teaching per semester, and you don't know what you're doing, and those poor kids. Um, <laughs> but you do it, you know, you do it, um, and you go through it. And I, I was, I was transformed by teaching. I couldn't believe how uh, lucky I was to to be able to learn from students and alongside students. So every semester, I learned something new, and every semester, students surprised me. This past year, I just started a new job at TOS. I have one of my TOS students here, so I'm so happy. Um, and this this year, the new challenge has been, you know, COVID. And having students in person and worrying about dying and getting sick. 
um, and and having spent two years of high school at home. And so there have been many moments. Um, one of the most um, impactful for me, which I write about in the book, was at the beginning of my teaching career, which is, which started for me in the state of Georgia, at the University of Georgia, which is a public institution, and that's why I met a lot of you here. Um, Georgia decided to ban undocumented students from accessing uh, public higher education. And I was just, had just been hired by the state of Georgia to teach Latinx studies at a public institution. And the majority of my students were undocumented or from mixed status families. And so it was a really difficult experience. And long story short, I, I along with a group of other um, all women faculty, uh, created a, an alternative university, Freedom University, which still runs in Atlanta since 2011. And for me, um, my school, my pedagogical school was Freedom University. Uh, because what I learned from the very first day um, of the classroom was that the most important thing that I can do in the classroom, the learning will happen. Students will read or not read, the learning will happen. The most important thing is for students to feel safe. Students have to feel safe in the classroom. If they don't, you're not doing your job. And so in that space, the first day, students were safe. They felt safe enough to talk about their status, which is a huge deal in a, in a, in a moment in which they're being persecuted. And students are crying and holding each other and hugging each other. And it just, you know, my new assistant professor just found on me that that was the first lesson and then it's a lesson for me as a teacher and as being long lasting. One of the most humbling and difficult moments I've had in teaching happened this semester. I'm teaching, I was teaching an intro to Latinx studies class, and I typically do assign a lot of group work. And for this group work, I have students work on creating Wikipedia pages um, as groups. And they had very few um, parameters, they were really open. The idea was that they would come in and sign up to whatever they wanted to do. And so there were, you know, really open subjects. Queer uh, Latinidad, Black Latinidad, Central American Life. So I think it's really, really open. When I went to look at the sign up sheet for the, for the project, only one student had signed up to do uh, Black Latinidad. Guess the only Black student in the class. And it broke me. I didn't, I was not prepared for that. That had never happened to me before. I didn't know what to do with it. Um, and I, I really wanted to, I wanted to yell, cry, punch something in the classroom. Of course, you cannot do that when you're teaching. So I took a deep breath. I paused. I told my students, this is very hard for me as a black Latina right now. I need a moment. And I took a moment to think. Um, and then we had a very, productive and important conversation that actually changed the course of the class for all of us and the syllabus. We scratched the entire class and all we did was black line and studies from that moment on. Yes. Um, and I was like, we clearly need to do something else. And we are all working on a black, everything, whatever you sign up for, put the word black before it. So it's going to be black, clear, line next slide. Um, and so it was a really, it was a, yeah, it's a humbling moment, a learning moment, a scary moment. Mm -hmm. um, but Moment of growth, for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. I'll just ask a couple more questions because I'm sure that there are many folks who would love to join in on the conversation, and I'm happy to jump back in if there's a lull. But um, you know, you talk about, and I, I think this is a really there's two questions I'll ask. It. Um, this first one is about this concept of the one, right? Um, I've long told my students, especially teaching at elite institutions, um, you know, elite. Uh, as I do, that you know, the the institution is is designed right for you to believe you are exceptional, right? To your and meaning exceptional to your race, right? You're here because you're actually not like the others among you, right? And I said, so my job in this classroom is to help you understand you are representative of your people, right? You're excellent because you're representative of them. Right? This is something my students, anyone who will tell you about, <laughs> will say, oh yes, here she is, Dr. Bada is saying the same thing again. But I, so I was so heartened to see you kind of attack this notion of the one, right? And, and your response to it, not me, right? Being like exactly what, what I would want everyone to say. 
Um, how, again, this is a, a how-to question because so much of your book is about how to do this. You know, what are some ways by which, whether they're daily practices, whether they're big conceptual ideas, that one gets there? Because I think for any of us, right, who entered into this, especially for those of us of a certain age where there really were so few of us, it was very easy to be seduced by that, right? We all had our own decolonizing of our minds to do. We would be lying if we didn't say that. So. What are some things that have helped you arrive immediately at that response to not move? I think for me, it's been a recognition that I didn't get here on my own. Um, that, and I write about this in the, in the book, there is, there is a way in which universities in particular, but I don't, I don't think this is unique to universities. I think we see this in a lot of elite uh, institutions, um, in which the they um, simultaneously, simultaneously make you feel special, right? They regard you with, oh, you're such a you know, our first Latina, and people take so much pride in this in these things. Like the first black woman to do X, Y, and C, that's scary to me. That in 2022, we're still mm -hmm. saying this is the first X to be doing Y and C. Um, and so there's on the one hand that sort of logic, and then on the other, but you're not good enough. Right? And so you're not, you know, you're not quite there, you're not good enough. Um, and so for me, it's been a, a reminder to myself always that so many people came before me. People I know, like in my direct family, you know, my grandma, my mother, my aunties, you know, uh, and people in my intellectual lineage, right? Also people that I don't know, people I've never met. And once you've being once you've served on in a couple of hiring committee, you know exactly how that works, right? How those decisions are made, and how um, no matter how talented you are, it takes people literally translating you to this other world that doesn't see you. Uh, so I come to to where I am in this world with a lot of humility, and knowing that I did not come here alone, that I have come crossing bridges that are literally the backs of so many people before me and acknowledging that and never thinking oh i made it you know like here i am this you know i wrote this book yeah i wrote this book and to write this book so many things had to happen and so many people have to be there and so many um so many doors were opened for me um and so i think that's that's the first recognition if you find yourself in a moment in a space in which people are telling you that you're so special and that you are the first of X, remember that you're not. That's a toxic fiction and that's how they get you. Um, find out <laughs> who was there. And even if you don't, have some gratitude for your ancestors that were before you doing the work so that you can be in this immensely privileged space that you occupy in the world. It's beautiful. So my last question is related to this as well. You know, so many who came before us, both our ancestors who were excluded from these various institutions, as well as tremendously uh, important thinkers and theorists, right, uh, uh, women of color and otherwise. And I think back to those early moments for me, that very first time when I read, you know, I remember exactly where I was sitting in the, you know, reserve room of the library when I read Audre Lorde for the first time, oh, right? Yeah. And, I, and that image of her rubbing the government butter that pellet, right, to then create the spirits. Can you just recall, as, you know, a moment or two from your own intellectual trajectory that for you was like blew the top of your head open yes. and you knew there was no going anywhere but forward and more toward that? For me, it was on Sabula for sure. And I must have been uh, 16 or so. Um, I started college very young, so I was in college by then. Um, and. I was in a, in a Latin studies class. It was my first semester, my first time, I didn't know about Latin studies. And at Rutgers, it was Puerto Rican studies. So I thought I was gonna be learning about Puerto Rico. And then I'm in this class and I'm reading this amazing Chingona. <laughs> and the first thing that got to me was the form. It's a poetry, it's an essay, just like from English to Spanish. What is this? This is how I talk. Oh my God! And I felt so seen. And I remember crying 
and feeling like the photo geek that I was. And I was at the library because I couldn't afford books. So I, I read all my books in college during those two hours that you get at the library on reserve. Um, and and I just I cry had to come back you know, just like what what is like happening to me? Reserve room in another book. Yes. <laughs> uh, but what I remember the most about this was that I felt it on my body. There was there was something physical that happened to me, you know, like butterflies in the stomach, but also wanting to vomit at the same time and just feeling rage at the same time and not being able to, to put it down. Um, that was for sure one of the most uh, beautiful moments for me. Uh, another one was later on, uh, the end of my of my, my senior year in, in college, reading Josefina Lives. Yes. Mm -hmm. And being, being like, oh, she's, that's me. Mm -hmm. see, and I need to meet this woman. And if you if you met her, she'll tell you that I followed her. Oh my God, I harassed the poor woman <laughs> until she finally <laughs> until she finally talked to me, and I never stopped harassing her. Uh, but but those were two of the those are two of the, my most influential, uh, and I still go back to those those texts, and I still teach them, and I still read them. You know? Thank you so much, Lucia. Thank you. This is wonderful. I really just want to take a moment to thank you. For this. Thank you. And so we now um, have the opportunity to engage in a communal conversation, to take individual questions uh, or comments. Uh, and so I would be happy to open it up to All questions right. and comments. I attend a private high school and in which it is predominantly white. Um, and so we're, uh, we have the privilege of having a lounge as a, as a grade. <coughs> and throughout this year, an issue has been that um, it, the lounge has been taken up by the white friend groups and that the people of color have sort of been forced out of there and made, uh, um, we feel unsafe and unwanted in that space. And so I'm working um, to hold more conversations about, first of all, addressing the problem and making sure that everybody sees the problem. Um, I think of it in my head as desegregating the lounge. Um, and so you talked about how you refer back to your ancestors and the people who came before you when you find yourself doing something that is, when you find yourself in previously uncharted territory. And I was wondering if there's ever times where maybe that isn't enough for you and maybe you're still scared and how you overcome that fear of the unknown. Let me just say, I've known Maya since she was born. <laughs> and I am so proud to know you. It's such a, I'm gonna cry. Um, beautiful question. I, I feel fear all the time. What I don't, allow is for fear to paralyze me and that there's a difference right acknowledging that you're afraid and that it it takes so much bravery for you to even be having those conversations in those kinds of spaces um that's you know that's so brave to be to be doing that it's okay to say i'm afraid and to embrace that vulnerability uh that you're feeling you're entitled to that and don't let anybody take that away from you but also don't let fear paralyze you um you want that space take it you know your dad's gonna hate me right now but you can stage a scene and just don't leave the lounge <laughs> just take your friends and sit there and own it until it's yours because that is the only way that we have gotten anything in this country so we'll talk more <laughs> Don't hate me, we hate it. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I mean, it's hard to follow <laughs> <laughs> a high schooler <laughs> that is such a Luda already. <laughs> Luda. Feliciale, I had a question about building bridges with the community, uh, which I think is something so challenging and you, know, you hear a lot about town gang culture in college towns and I'm thinking of 
uh, specific campuses, right, that we both know that are also uh, racialized spaces, right, and so the, the, the kind of racial geographies of these institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've done so much amazing work, right, just uh, not only occupying institutional spaces, but bring, bridging spaces outside of the institution. Uh, so I wonder if you could say more about that as it's in, in the book, but also just how you tie it in to the work that you do. Thank you, Luda. So, in part for me, it comes natural because I am not, I never disengaged from my communities. I, I just, I couldn't, not because I didn't, I, don't, I, I just couldn't. It was too much uh, part of, of, of my life. Um, I'm a big fan of using institutional resources. People, recording. <laughs> of using institutional resources and diverting it. To, to communities and to the communities around. We do all these events, you know, when we're professors, we bring amazing speakers, people who are talking about communities, and they're talking to mostly white audiences in the institutions. And so it's really, really critical that we don't do that, right? And that we open these spaces uh, to our community. Some of, some of the strategies I've used, for example, when doing exhibits, um, Museum spaces are so unwelcoming of working class people of all colors, right? They, you don't, it, it's, I cannot imagine my parents going to a gallery to see. You. So one of the, the strategies that I've, that I've done in the past is work with communities to do one day exhibits in places that are the community. <laughs> Makes it easier for people who work and cannot I afford to take half the way off to you know make the, the trek to whatever gallery, but also it's visible right there, uh, and people can engage. Hosting uh, events not on campus but off campus and making the campus pay for it. Um, that's another way to do it. Um, so finding ways in which <laughs> Veronica's laughing. <laughs> got some game. Going. Um, there, there are ways in which we can do practical things that will make it easier for people in our community to engage. And the, and the most basic thing is like, watch your language. And by that I don't mean don't curse, by that I mean there's so many better ways in which we can say the things we theorize and connect with people. Sometimes, the majority of times, nobody can understand what academics are saying. Because we make it so complicated, yes. right? And we're and when you when you say it in pretense, it's like not that smart, right? So <laughs> just ground the thing that you're saying. You know, one of the major critiques I always get as a scholar is that my language is too simple, and mm -hmm. I respond by saying, "Well, thank you." Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I actually want people to understand what I write. Is that a crime? Right, like so if you know anybody who's read Homie Baba, you mean fucking four lines. So you can't find the subject and the verb. That's not that's not writing, right? So finding ways to ground your work and you do a great job of that with with your own work, right? So you know enough about, about this. But yeah, use institutional resources in ways that really bring back to communities and think think beyond reading the land acknowledgement, think about what is your community what is your institution doing to hurt the community they, they live in, right? And, and, and pass that knowledge to your students. Make them aware, because sometimes they're not. Some students are really aware, others are not. Mm -hmm. And so sharing that um, and talking about that and making your assignments be grounded not on extracting from the communities, but in bringing back to those communities. No. <laughs> you know, I know. <laughs> I'm just sitting here. I've been here amen corner. Though. <laughs> but, you know, I guess what to do with the exhaustion of doing all of this, of speaking to students, of speaking to the community, of thinking how to write in terms that bring that brings everybody in to make safe spaces to continuously hold yourself up. Yeah. And in these institutions that want to kill us, you know. <laughs> what to do when, even if you're not the one, you're the five. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> you're not going to be like the hundred. No. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right then? No, no, no. It's not going to happen. So, like, so what do you do? Because I'm tired. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I'm, I'm really tired 
too. Yeah. And in the book, I talk about our, our exhaustion being ancestral. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, and so I don't, I'm going to be like, do as I say, not as I do, and rest. <laughs> um, I'm working on, on that. Uh, but one of the one of the strategies that I've developed is, is is really working on saying no to a lot of institutional work. I am not I don't don't do diversity inclusion work ever, no exception, that's a no. Because we've seen it. Yeah. Right? We see that it doesn't do what it says it's supposed to do and you put in all this effort and there is a memo and that's all there is, a memo at the end of two years of work. Uh, so, so picking and choosing what you commit to, regardless of, and voicing that. So, you know, those of us who are tenured, right, we get requests for tenure reviews, we get requests for article reviews. So people don't understand when we say invisible labor, is that the majority of what we do yeah. is on scene. Yeah. I have 24 graduate students. That is a lot of letter writing, wow. in addition to other graduate students that I take on as, as mentees. Wow. So the way in which that labor, it's like, you know, on us all the time, uh, and then it gets, you know, piled on and piled on. So getting paid for the labor you do, getting recognition for the labor you do. I um, was recently recently had to put in my, my promotion this year and I they, they don't require a mentoring statement. And I was like, well, then I'm going to write one and you're going to read it. Yes. I don't care that you don't require it. You need to see what I've been doing because this is taking the majority of my time. So finding ways to like shove it and like, yeah. this is what I'm doing and I need recognition for this. But I think the main thing is rest um, and letting your students know when you're saying no, why? It's not because you don't want to, but it's because if I go to every evening event, I won't see my son. Would you like to not see your parents when you're eight or nine or ten? Right. So verbalizing and, and, and making sure you know students also understand that when they're asking more of you, they're contributing to your exploitation as well. I think educating students is really important because they really just don't. They just try to be nice, they like you, nobody else is listening to them, so they invite you to this next thing, and you feel bad and you go, and then you crash, and you're exhausted, and you're... So say no, rest, and get paid. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sally. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to say thank you, I love the book, it's beautiful, and I appreciate you, so I, I thank you, I see you, I love all of the work you've done, and one of the things I love about the book is how specific you are. I love the simplicity. It's incredible that in 100 pages you included so much. You included concrete tips about teaching. You included history, theorizing, and like calls to action, and as well as um, documentation, like some of what you read about some of your friends who are in other industries. So that's what kind of stayed with me after the book. A lot of things stayed with me after the book. But one of them was that sense, like, you know, the moments when you're saying things like boycott, sit in, <laughs> strike, like that's my vibe. Like I feel like that's so important and you're just such an incredible and admirable example of someone who's so honest and brave. So I, I deeply look up to you. I, I like love all your work. We, you know, I used it this semester, your first book, Borders of Dominicanidad. The students just loved it. Like your work is so amazing at so many levels. And so, yes, thank you. I don't you. pay her. Thank you. <laughs> Some of the calls to action, if you wanted to say anything about that, because I always have visions of like, what would it look like if we organized as women of color across industries and really shut this yeah. down? It would all literally. And you know, and to me, it's like that assertiveness of like, no, this is ours. We've been doing this. Like, move. This is us. Like, and we just have to the Buddha philosophy. I'm taking with me as well. So thank you. <laughs> Need a T-shirt. Thank you. Need a T-shirt. Las Duras. Um, so, a couple of things, there's so much in what you said. Um, it's really important that while we're fighting the fight inside these institutions, we also have spaces outside that sustain us. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when we see people getting burned out, it's because these spaces, these institutions, these companies, these places we work for are so violent. Mm -hmm. And if you're fighting and fighting against this really colonizing machines, because that's all they are, because, you know, we talk about decolonization, but we haven't, you know, I don't even get me started on that. You know, the, 
that it's really exhausting, right? That's the exhaustion that Natasha was talking about. So making sure that you have other spaces that you're building with, right? Communion with other people outside of these institutions to keep you real, to keep you grounded. Uh, and knowing when to rest and picking your battles, that's, that's really key. Um, and developing the strategies that fit for the particular fight that you're taking on and taking on small fights. I'm a big fan of that, right? So it's very tiring and overwhelming when we think about the state of the world right now. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to kind of go like, what's the point? You know, like, we got rid of Trump and then we got, you know, like, <laughs> it's very easy to kind of be like, there's no, there's no point. But when you look around you, and when you look at the, the little spaces you inhabit, whether it is your building in the Bronx, or your department, or your classroom, there is so much transformation that you can enact. And there is so much community that you can build in those little spaces. And that actually, as cheesy as it may sound, has a really lasting impact. Otherwise, you are not, will not be here, right? Um, and so it's it's about finding those small fights, for me, anyway, it's about fighting those small fights that are not really small, right? <laughs> At the end of the day, they're not. Um, and finding ways to connect outside of that insular space of our institution. If I had, if my work and my words had been defined by the institution that I worked for in which we both met, I would be a mess right now. I wouldn't be standing here, I wouldn't be writing, I wouldn't be working. But that institution, they did their thing, and that thing has nothing to do with me or my work. They can't touch that, right? They never could and they never will. This is mine and I take it and go somewhere else because at the end of the day, that's just a fucking job. And I'm an immigrant, so I know how to get a job. I <laughs> there's, not, there's not issues with that. So finding, Sandy, creating, co-creating those communities within and outside and figuring out what's the battle that I want to invest with. And then looking for those accomplices, not just in your colleagues, but in your students. I cannot stress that enough. The institutions have been for so many years creating these hierarchies to keep us apart. And for me, as a first gen, it was students that saved me, not my colleagues. It was my students. They were the ones who saw me and they were the ones who made a home for me in those spaces. And so finding ways to kind of work across is really key. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Rocha. I think we have time to make one more question. Yes. Hi, um, so your work has definitely been the work that exploded my mind. So it's been such a privilege to see you there. Um, but I guess I was thinking about, as a queer Dominican, the council of community has always been something that is so problematic, especially when you live in the liminal spaces of community. Yeah. And then I wonder what you do to kind of keep the desire to nurture a community that keeps rejecting that action going. So one of the one of the invitations I make in the book is to think about community as a verb and to kind of reject this idea that we find community. Some of us are lucky enough to be like welcome into communities and finding them there and just kind of coming in and just being part of it. And some of us have to build it. And so there isn't one Dominican that, right? That's the whole point of that first book for me. The Dominican is it's plural. And some people get say things like, well, that I'm not Dominican because I'm Croatian, or that I'm not Dominican because I'm queer. They don't get to tell me how to leave my Dominican in that. That's not, I don't, I don't need them to tell me that. I never did. And so I wouldn't invest one second of your time and energy on the people that reject you. They don't deserve you. Mm -hmm. They're not your people. Even if they share a passport or nationality with you, that's not your people. Find your people and build with them, right? And live your Dominicanidad the way that you choose to, be, to believe it and live it with those people. Y los otros que se mueven, right? Que se vayan por allá a comerse un mango en una esquina. But yeah, you don't need them. You don't need them to, to approve you or to tell you who you are. And I know it's exhausting because we want to connect because those people are also our families, mm -hmm. right? And so how do we, 
how do we how do we deal with that piece? And so I, I actually have a I have a son who's a, now a preteen, and I was having this conversation with him as I left him with my parents to come and do this, and I was like, okay, Mijo, remember, you love your family, but you do not have to accept everything they say, mm -hmm. and you do not have to believe everything they say. So it's it's about just finding what what works for you. For some of us, it's being like, you know what, you're not my family, I can't mm -hmm. deal with you. Bye. For others, it's finding a balance in which. Okay, I love you, but you're too much. You're not. You, you don't give me what I need, and then in that elsewhere, building that family elsewhere. So, yeah, find your people and build with your people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lorcha. Thank you, Word Up. Uh, thank you all for this wonderful uh, for making community a verb tonight. For sure. For sure. For sure. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Um, we're gonna transition now into the signing. So if you wanna purchase a book, you will. You can do so at the counter over there. Um, and I also just wanna let you know of other events that we're having with Word Up. So um, on Monday, we're actually gonna have a Gran Combo, which, uh, not the bands, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just talking about this issue. Um, no, we're gonna have five amazing Latina authors um, that are gonna be in discussion, all moderated by Angie Cruz, who's here. Uh, all you have to do if you wanna come is buy one of the participating books. Uh, we have more info over there. And then we also have more events at Word Up that, are, uh, that you can check out at the table over there, so. Definitely follow us on social media um, and just hear what we're doing at Word Up. But thank you.